This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. I would like to welcome Stada Yasmina Mujahid. With her unique brand of inspiration and thought-provoking talks, Yasmin Mujahid has become one of the most sought-after speakers in the Muslim world. After graduate, graduating with a master's in journalism and mass communications, she has pursued a career in writing. Yasmin worked as a writing instructor at the Cardinal Stritch University and a, con- and a contributor to the Huffington Post. She has a great success in her debut book, Reclaim Your Heart, which was released to a critical acclaim. Currently, she is an instructor at the Al Maghrib Institute. Please help me in welcoming Yustada Yasmina Mujahid. Assalamu alaikum. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي um, I want to begin by apologizing I'm a bit sick uh, but إن شاء الله تعالى I have enough of a voice to speak to you as of now uh, Pardon? No, no, I'm okay <laughs> I'll stand uh, I actually want to uh, share just a couple things with you. Every time I get asked to speak at events like this, I try to leave the audience with essentially one message, one take-home message. And if and I feel like if, if we can leave with that one take-home message, then uh, I will have felt that uh, I accomplished my goal. And, and that take-home message is this. A lot of times... Uh, especially before I come on the stage, you'll have many people who came before me encouraging you to give and encouraging you to share and encouraging you to serve. And that's the purpose of these events, is to encourage you to help others. Um, And a lot of times the, the focus in that is help others because they need your help. Help others because they are impoverished or they are going through difficult times. And that's all true. That's all true. But a lot of times the focus becomes help others because they need you. I'm actually going to stand up here and say something totally different. And that is this. I'm going to ask you to help others because you need them. Which is a bit strange because... Uh, we're talking about people in Syria. We're talking about people, you know, we're, we're, we ourselves here, we're comfortable, you know, we have a, amazing food, um, we, we aren't worrying about getting bombed, we are a bit worried about being detained, but that's a different issue. Um, we, we aren't worried about being, we're not worried about our overall physical safety. Um, and yet I am telling you that you need them. And that, that's unusual. That's a strange thing to say. And I'll explain why I'm saying that. The reason why I'm saying that is when, and this is the argument I want to make just for the next few minutes that I have, is that actually when you help another person, you're helping yourself. And that may seem strange. We may not have ever thought of it that way, but in fact, that's the truth. That when you help another person, the very first person who you're helping is yourself. And that helping that other person is a beautiful consequence of help and service, but essentially you are helping yourself first and foremost. And I'm going to tell you why that's the case using two different methods, um, two different paradigms. So when I, when I talk about this, I like to talk not only from an Islamic point of view, but even just simply from a secular psychology point of view. What, what studies have found that study things like, that look into things like happiness, things like well-being, things when, you know, there's a lot of studies nowadays that move away from this whole focus on abnormal psychology. Traditional psychology has been very focused on looking at a human being and thinking, okay, this is what's wrong with the human being, and here are the symptoms, and here are the treatments. But there's a new wave of psychology called positive psychology. And positive psychology focuses, its, it's focus is a little different. Its focus is more on how can we help human beings 
how can we study what what will help increase well-being? The, this is the, the wave of psychology that studies things like happiness. How do you increase happiness? How can I live a, a higher quality of life and have a greater well-being? Now, in this in this research, what they found is one of the things that they found is that when it comes to happiness, happiness is one of those things we tend to think that if I can just if I can just achieve X Y Z, then I will be happy. If I could just get that job, or if I could just um, you know get that raise or that house or whatever it happens to be that we believe will give us that happiness, we think that happiness is something that once I receive this this thing, then I will be happy. But what they found, interestingly enough, in research is that when people have events in their life which they consider very positive, they win the lottery, you know, they, they get a new job, something that they really, really want, that what happens to their happiness is there's only a temporary spike, if that makes sense. So essentially people, everyone, has something called a baseline happiness, where they're at a certain level of happiness or well-being. And that when events happen in your life that you've really been craving, that you've really been working for, something that's considered a very positive event, there will be a spike, but it's quite temporary. It's short-lived. So a person will have a, a, an increase in their happiness, but then eventually they just go back to baseline. And that people essentially live in their, around their baseline. And it's not very easy to increase the baseline. So what do they do? They look at, well, what are the things that can increase the entire baseline, not just give us these spikes? And one of the things that they found, which, which I found just blew my mind, is that one of, the most, um, one of the most reliable ways to increase the baseline, not just get those spikes, but increase the entire baseline of happiness in my, my happiness, your happiness, well-being in general. One of the most reliable ways to increase the baseline is the service of others. It's, it's to help other people. It's to give to other people. It's to be generous. It's to, it's to aid a person who's in need. That's what they found. They found that things like volunteerism, that this was, this was, in, fact, this was in fact therapeutic to the person who was doing it. And what's very interesting about that is uh, there was another study. So everyone tells you uh, money doesn't buy happiness, right? Everyone knows that. This actually isn't true. <laughs> money does buy happiness. And now people are wondering, well, what's wrong with her, right? What did, um, money does buy happiness. But what's interesting is it only buys happiness when you spend it on others. That they found that in, in these studies that the people who were using their money, who spent money on others, that it in fact did make them happier. But when they spent it on themselves, it did not. Isn't that fascinating? So I have this money, but if I spend it on myself, it doesn't really do much for my own well-being or my own happiness. It doesn't increase my happiness. However, they found that when, they, when you spend it on others, it actually makes you happier. And, in, and this was such a powerful result, such a powerful outcome, that they found it even applied. If I, if I even call to mind something that I bought for another person or something I spent on another person, even that will, will make the person feel happy. Just remembering a time when they spent on others, it will actually make them happy. It will increase their happiness. So now we're starting to see a trend here, right? That this is something within the fitra of a human being. This is something that, that is divine. It's a divine design. That it's something that the creator has designed and inputted within the human being that when I give to others, I feel good. That it actually makes me feel happier to give and help and serve others. Now there's another layer here that I feel is deeper. And that is this. Any time there is a design within a human being, obviously we know by the creator, a design within a human being is because Allah, the creator, God, whoever, whatever you call the creator, intends for us to have a certain outcome. That's why he designed it that way. And what, when I started reflecting on this, on this fact, the fact that even secular psychology has found the powerful effect of giving, the powerful effect of service, the powerful effect of, of being, you know, helping one another. 
And, and what it made me realize is this is what God wants from us. This, because Allah, because God, the designer, right, the creator, put within us a, a, a nature, a fitrah, that makes it feel good to give. It makes it, we actually get a reward intrinsically. You know what I'm saying? That it's intrinsic within that immediate reward before we wait till the day of judgment. We haven't even gotten to that subject yet, right? Just now here, even a person, even, and this is what's amazing, is Allah created this in the human, even a person who doesn't believe in God, even a person who doesn't have faith is going to feel good giving. That's just the human design. And what that shows us is how much God loves us to give and serve one another. Because he designed us that way. He designed us to actually get pleasure from giving, to get that intrinsic reward when I serve others. And that just blew my mind. That's one of the only ways to increase your baseline happiness. And everything else in the world won't do it. The lottery won't do it. Your promotion won't do it. You know, getting whatever power position, it won't do it. But serving others will. And that's amazing. That just shows the power and importance of service to others within the divine design, within that design. Now, something else that they found, and I said, you know, it's very, very difficult to increase that baseline happiness. Something else, only other thing that, that, that they found um, reliably to increase happiness, the, the entire baseline, is the practice of gratitude. It's to show and practice regular gratitude. Uh, so something, for example, like keeping a gratitude journal, writing down five things every day that you're grateful for, will in fact increase your baseline happiness and has been found to to be a powerful uh, treatment for depression. That, that if they have people who are suffering from depression, just having them keep a gratitude journal will actually help them in treating their depression. Similarly, similarly, when a person is suffering from depression, when a person is suffering from any kind of uh, difficulty, when they themselves are in a, in a low place, they themselves are suffering. One of the fastest ways to come out of your own suffering is to help another person who's suffering, is to aid another person who is in difficulty, to serve someone else. And it's, it, in fact, it's extremely therapeutic for the one who's suffering that it's one of the fastest ways to come back out of your own dark place is to help another person who's in a dark place. So you find that these, these, are, just, these are just, again, secular psychological uh, reasons why service is in fact serving myself. That essentially that when I serve another person, I'm actually helping myself, I'm serving myself. Now, if I switch over to the Islamic paradigm, and what does, what does the text say about service? What does the text in the Qur'an and the Hadith and the Sunnah say about serving others? You actually, it'll blow your mind when you read how much emphasis there is within our, our tradition, within our deen about serving others and helping others and the immense reward for that. One of the things, um, now I told you that I have a take-home message for you. Does everyone remember what it was? Anyone? We, when we serve others, we are serving ourselves, or rather we help because we are the ones in need of those people and to help. Now, this, I'm going to add another take-home message. And this is something that you'll find is an overall theme. Whenever you, if you scan the text, Quranic, um, Hadith, Sunnah, if you scan the text, you'll find that there's one, there's among many, there is an overall theme. And that theme is this, how I treat the creation is how I should expect God to treat me. That's, that's the, the message. How I treat others, and this includes all creation, by the way. It includes humans as well as animals. As we know, there are many texts about the treatment of animals and people who were in fact saved because of their treatment of animals and other people who were punished because of their mistreatment. Of animals. So in general, the way that I treat the creation is how I should expect to be treated by the creator. Now that's another very powerful, you know, um, message, right? That's a very powerful understanding. Because now all of a sudden, 
when I am good to others, when I give and I am generous and I serve others, and I am selfless, I am in fact doing what? Because you see, what am I doing? I am, I know, once I know with certainty that how I treat other people is going to be how God treats me, then all of a sudden my goodness to others is in fact getting goodness for myself from the Creator. And that's a different level, right? Because now we're not talking about human beings giving to me. We're talking about God giving to me. We're talking about God giving to me. You know, that's a different level. And this is found again and again and again throughout the Qur'an and throughout the Hadith. For example, you know, um, during the time when Aisha radiallahu anha was being accused of being unchaste, and her father Abu Bakr radiallahu anha found out that one of the people who was accusing her was a relative. A relative of him who he was even financially supporting. Now when he found this out, I mean we can imagine how we would feel, right? Somebody slandering your own daughter and someone from your family doing it. Not only someone from your family, but someone who you're, you're financially supporting, you're giving finan- financial support to. So what does Abu Bakr an do? He doesn't go and try to get revenge. He's not like going after him. All he does is he withholds the financial support. That's it. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a verse upon this occasion. He reveals a verse in which he says to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, addressing this specific case, but of course all people for all time, because it's a timeless book. And in that ayah he says, let them, what's translated as, let them pardon and overlook. Why? Why? In the Surah An-Nur, why? أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Do you not love for Allah to forgive you? And that's it. So right there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established a connection, right? And that connection is that when I am a certain way with people, see, if I forgive others, if Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu forgave that man, that relative, for what he did, which is something that is unspeakable what he did, yeah? And if he forgives him, then Allah is saying that there's a connection between that and getting the forgiveness of Allah. And that's a whole different way to look at it, right? Because you and I, we don't like to forgive people sometimes because we feel that they don't deserve our forgiveness, right? He, she doesn't deserve my forgiveness because he, she hasn't done, you know, hasn't kissed my feet enough, hasn't groveled enough, hasn't even said sorry. This relative didn't do any of those things. He didn't do any of those things. But Allah here is... is completely shifting the focus. The focus is not even about the relative. Allah doesn't say, forgive the relative because he was regretful, or because he said sorry, or because he helped you one time, you know, in the past. It wasn't actually even about, the relative almost becomes irrelevant in the equation. Does that make sense? In the sense that, Allah is saying to Abu Bakr and to all of us that how we treat others is really essentially at the root about our relationship with God directly, about me and Allah. And he says, أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Do you not love for Allah to forgive you? And so it really just became about Abu Bakr and Allah. It didn't, you know, it like Allah is taking the relative out of the equation in a sense. It's really a... a, a, a a vertical transaction between me and Allah. It's not horizontal. It's not just me and the creation. But that the creation and how I am with the creation becomes a means to get my relationship with God. And that's really, really very mind-blowing. It's very, very... It changes the way we interact. Because now it's no longer... You see, if I expect... If I expect that my return will come from above, then I no longer expect it or wait for it from the creation. This, what this creates is a people who are generous, a people who are giving, a people who who are serving of others, a people who are forgiving. Why? Because we know that our pay, yeah, ours in a sense, we know we're getting paid, but by who though? By Allah. You know when you're working in like a corporation or something, (coughs) 
And maybe suppose you're working in customer service or something like that. You're dealing with customers, but the customers aren't the ones paying you, right? You don't get your pay from the customer. So how do you treat the customer even if they're terrible to you? I mean, has anyone worked in, in retail? You, exactly. You know that you the customer's always right. The customer's always right. Like, you have to treat the customer absolutely 100%. You have to treat them in the best way. Why? Is it because they're going to pay you at the end of the call? Mm -mm, you don't get a cent from the customer, in fact. Or at the end of the transaction, you don't get anything from the customer. And yet, why do you continue to give them the best treatment? Because you want to get paid at the end of the month. And you don't want to get fired. It's not because you like the customer. It's not because the customer likes you. And it's not because they're going to pay you anything. They actually give you nothing. You get paid by the boss. And you know that how you are with each customer is going to be reflective in how how much you get paid at the end of the month. And sometimes you might get bonuses. Why? Because you're really good with customers. Makes sense. And this on a much higher divine scale is how Allah is with us in the creation. That how we are with these with these customers, as you put it, other people, other creation, is reflective in then how Allah pays us. We get paid from Him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a um, an account that's infinite. Makes sense? He doesn't run out. He doesn't run out of payment. He doesn't run out of, of blessings and mercy. And, and there's a hadith that actually says this. That says that those who do not show mercy to those on the earth will not be shown mercy from the one in the heavens. That Allah will not show mercy to a person who doesn't show mercy to people. And so what we always have to keep in mind is this. How I am with people, how I am with the creation, is a reflection of how God will be with me, not only in this life, but in the next as well. But also in the next. And that takes me to the next step. I've spoken so far about the reward in this life. And there is a reward. There's in fact, first I said there's an intrinsic and immediate reward in this life, in that I actually feel happier, and it's an alleviation of my own pain. It's an alleviation of my own pain to help another person who's in pain. And that's a fact, and it's been shown in, in countless studies. Not only is it that intrinsic, immediate reward in this life, but on top of that is that I will also be blessed by God in this life. One thing anyone, anyone who's ever done it will, will attest to, and I know, I know anyone in this room can attest to this, any amount of money... Actually, any gift, but we'll start with money. Any amount of money that you give for the sake of Allah, it always gets returned to you. And when it gets returned to you, it's usually multiplied. And I always see people nodding their heads because if you try it, you know it. It's experiential. That you, in fact, do not lose the money that you give for the sake of God. You actually don't lose it. It becomes like an investment. So you see, for example, if I were to ask people in this room, <clears throat> if I were to ask people in this room, does investing your money mean you're losing your money? Everyone in this room would know what the answer. When I invest my money, what am I do? Am I losing that money? Question. I'm actually growing that money, right? But if I ask a little kid, a five-year-old, if I ask a little kid who, who only has like, you know, saved up $20 and they're really excited about the 20 and now I ask that 20, that five-year-old kid to put that $20 into an investment, they will feel what? That they've lost that money, right? Why? Because the understanding of that child is not as advanced. The understanding of the child is as soon as I let go of this money, it's lost. Now, what am I, am I saying that? Because some of us, we sort of have the spiritual understanding of the five-year-old. That we think sometimes that when we give money for the sake of Allah, we're losing it. And that's why it's hard to give. That's the reason. Because no one wants to lose. No one wants to lose. But the reality is, it's in fact an investment. It's that we're investing that money. We're not losing that money. It's a very, there's a very um, powerful lesson that the Prophet ﷺ taught us through an incident that happened with Aisha radiallahu What happened was, one time when he was out, she had donated, there was like a, 
<coughs> a lamb or a goat. And what happened is, when he returned, she told him that I gave all of this animal for the sake of Allah, and I only just kept your favorite part for us. And you know what? His, his answer was so deep. He said, in fact, we've kept the part you gave. And we've just lost the part you kept. Does that make sense? I'll repeat that. What he's teaching her is that the part that she gave for the sake of Allah is the part they're keeping. That Because there's no loss in what you give for the sake of Allah. There's no loss. It's just an investment. It's an investment that gets return manifold. Just as investments do, that's the whole point of investment. It doesn't just come back as you gave it, but it comes back multiplied. So he says to her that the part that you gave is what we kept. And the part that we kept is what we lost. And that's powerful. That's very powerful. We see this exact message in the Qur'an. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, after, you know, in, 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 Allah, in the Qur'an what Allah does is He makes oaths. You know, what, what do you and I do when we want someone to really believe us? We want to really emphasize something we're about to say. What do we say as Muslims? Wallah. Wallah. Or I swear, but in, in Arabic, wallah. Wallahi or wallah. What you've done, you've put a wow in front of Allah, which means you're swearing by God. That's what wallah means. Okay. So when we want to emphasize something, we say wallah or wallahi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also makes oaths by His own creation. And so you'll find in the Qur'an, وَالشَّمْسِ وَالضُحَاهَا This is an oath by the sun, and etc. And there's many different um, verses where Allah makes an oath. In one of, this, one of the ayahs, in Surah Al-Asr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes an oath by time. And if, if you actually study the surah, it's just three ayahs, but scholars say within these three ayahs you can understand your whole deen. Very, very powerful ayahs. Allah makes an oath by time. After making this oath, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ Indeed, mankind is in a state of loss. Indeed, mankind is in a state of loss. See, every uh, the nature of this life is that we're always losing things. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an existence that's passing away, right? What are we losing? We're losing time. We're losing health. We're losing... Um, our abilities, we're losing beauty. Everything is, is slowly deteriorating, right? We move towards aging, we move towards sickness. This is the nature of dunya, right? There's nothing you can do about it. No matter how much plastic surgery you, take, you, know, you, you, you get, no matter how many ageless creams you use, you, you can't stop it from happening, right? And so Allah is telling us this, this reality. But here's something so powerful. Allah then says that there's an exception. After saying, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ Indeed, mankind is in a state of loss. Overall, universal loss. Right? Then he says, إِلَّا إِلَّا means except. So now there's an exception to this rule of loss. There's an exception. Who are those who are exempt? The exception, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ amanu, Except those who believe. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And do righteous deeds. See, iman by itself, faith, a lot of times people, you know, this, my, um, they, 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 they think that all that matters is faith in the heart, but it doesn't show up in action. It's not enough, right? We can't say, I pray in my heart, I fast in my heart, I wear hijab in my heart. It's something we have to also do externally. And so Allah is saying, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ So those who believe, that's the first qualification. The second is they do righteous deeds, that they turn that belief into action. And then, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ It's completely comprehensive. They believe, they do righteous deeds, and then they enjoin others. They call one another. They do not only believe and practice in private, and in their rooms, and in their caves, and in their masajid, but they go out to the community, they work, and they serve, and they call others to goodness. Tawasaw bil haq, they call for truth. You know, these people who are standing and protesting now, right? They are seeing a situation which they believe is unjust. 
even if it's not affecting them directly, but they see that it is unjust and they are going and standing for truth. This is what a believer should do. That it's not only what's affecting me and my family, right? It's not only about just praying and fasting and, and, and going to the masjid and coming home, but it's also service. It's going out and helping and standing for justice and standing up for what's right. So this is part of the qualifications. They believe, they do righteous deeds. They enjoin one another to truth. And they enjoin one another to patience. Because in order to take this path, you're going to have to have a lot of patience. And you're going to have to have a lot of perseverance. And you're going to have to be able to stand firm. And so what does this teach us? It teaches us that everything we own is actually in a state of loss. That we are in a state of loss of every single thing that we own, our money, our health, our time, except, except those things which we give to Allah. And so that's really powerful because our money, just like this example with the goat, our money doesn't go with us in our grave, does it? Is there anyone in this room that's going to take their money with them to their grave? False. We actually can take our money to our grave. How? Well, that sounds insane. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ said that when a person dies and enters their grave, all of their deeds end except for three. Except for three. And what are those three things? One of them is something called sadaqa jariyah. Which means a sadaqa, a charity that you gave that continues to benefit others, it's actually going to come back to your grave. So your money is coming back to you in your grave, but only that which you gave to Allah. Isn't that powerful? The rest stays. The rest stays. The rest doesn't come back with you. Only that which you give, you keep. And that's the lesson. أَقُولِ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ وَلَكُمْ إِنَّهُ غَفُنُ الرَّحِيمُ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُ بِحَمْدَكَ أَشْهَدُ وَنَّا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ اسْتَغْفِرَكُ وَأَتُوبُ لَيْكَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ و